Hey, Andy, how's it hey. going? Living the dream. How are you? I'm doing very good. Thanks for uh, joining us on Fuse Calls. So um, you started out as a graphic designer, but you've said that you always had a propensity to do art and design, even as far back as high school. Uh, can you give some background on what you were like in high school? Yikes. Um, okay. High school. Sure. Um, in Jersey, right? In Jersey. Yeah. Um, so I, I served time in an all boys prep school, uh, which is, I'm looking at your face and what you're imagining is pretty much what it was. Uh, like shirt, tie, blazer, the whole thing. I went to, I went to parochial school myself. So. Fair enough. All right. Common thread. Very good. Um, but it was, it was interesting. Like, um, like, I guess a lot of kids, like, I feel like I didn't really fit in. Like I wasn't, I wasn't particularly athletic. I mean, even now I run when chased. Uh, I'm a short guy, had a bad case of gravity. And like, I, it was just kind of awkward as I guess, you know, most high school kids are, um, you know, I had like significant learning challenges. So it was just like a really interesting time for me, but like three kind of good things happened. Like one, they had a theater program, which was really cool. And there were like five sister schools. So I'm like, you know, they would bus in the girls for rehearsal. And I was like, I, you mean they come to us? So I was like, yeah, sign me up. Uh, but like, but also like I was, I'm a pretty significant introvert. So, you know, doing theater was a, a good way for me to kind of get out of that shell a little bit and, you know, fear test and get a little bit more comfortable with other people, which is you know really good. Um, Another thing I, I discovered too was um, like sketch notation and mind mapping. And like, I was always a, just an awful menace, horrible student. And like, when I discovered that, um, a lot of things made more sense. Like English class all of a sudden, like, oh, I get Shakespeare now. Like, you know, it's just kind of really good. Um, and the other- you, Sorry, you would mind map uh, in high school? You kind of, you would, you basically like, I don't get Shakespeare, so I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna mind map? Oh, okay. okay. Um, kind of what you mean. Yeah, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. So, um, a lot of uh, a lot of the designers like mind mapping is a technique where um, you'll you'll start with with the idea um, in the center of the page, and you'll kind of branch off how yeah. things connect and how ideas are. So you have kind of like a, a wide lens view of the entire thing that's going on, and like you know, it makes complicated things a little bit more sense. Like we do a lot at work as well just to track ideas too. And the sketch notation was really good because like most designers like we're not linear thinkers, <laughs> you know, having to listen to things is just cruel and unusual for us. But like the sketch notation of being able to like, um, like draw the concept of the idea of what's going on and connect that to each other and, and get that flow is like really good. Um, if you allow me to like yada yada the science behind it, when you start drawing, um, it activates a different part of your brain. So you you remember things in a different way. And that was something that actually really worked for me. So it was like the last two years of like high school I actually became a much better student. So it's cool. Like those two things were really good. Did that, did that answer your question? Oh yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I, I've got a I got a whole list of other questions oh, okay. for that. But but um <laughs> but keep going. So so you yeah. would uh, mind map Shakespeare and you just intuitively did this in high school. I mean you I, I, I wasn't very good, so I had nowhere to go but up. And um, I remember there was like a, this like news thing that they would, uh, like a TV. Actually, Anderson Cooper, you know the guy from CNN? Yeah. So he, he was actually like a broadcaster like 20 years ago and did this like high school public broadcasting that was cool. And they did a segment on, on mind mapping and sketch animation. I was like, all right, I'll try it. You know, I love to draw, I love to, and it made, like, it made complex stuff really simpler for me to understand. So it was like super cool. And I was like, yeah, I'm totally doing this now. And um, it's something that I took with me throughout my career. Um, like I show you um, all those notebooks over there. Those are most of my like work notebooks on that show. Just, they're just full of just all of the stuff that's going on. So no, I, I have to say um, nobody taught me anything about whiteboarding, which is yeah. similar. Sure. And once I uh, discovered whiteboarding, which is same type of thing, just yeah. that, once it, it it like changed my career altogether. They would call yeah. me whiteboard man. Uh, oh, awesome. like, uh, but yeah yeah so interesting interesting yeah it was it was it was a good thing that happened there too and also like um something else in in, in the this particular high school like they had a um, they had a magazine and they had a newspaper and they had a yearbook and these were i was like oh i'm kind of interested in this i'm like 16 years old doing like layout and paste up so it was just kind of the start of really interesting aspects of design in my career so one of the things we're doing with Fuse this year is we are going to integrate um, some activities with local high schools oh. and we want to leave behind uh, 
some artifacts, maybe some design even, or we just want to leave something behind for these young kids. So, uh, you know, when I, when I was doing some research on you and, I, and you were talking about your high school experience, you know, and now when you're talking about, you were actually kind of challenged as a student. Yeah. Can you speak about how you went from doing uh, you know, kind of doing these design spreads in your room or or doing uh, mind mapping Shakespeare so that you could get by and kind of walk through uh, the journey to where, you know, how did that get you to working on a, a GE, a $42 billion uh, okay. and working on their brand? I mean, I would think some of these high school kids, you know, how, how in the world does that happen? Okay, that's a that's a very good question, um, and I think when you when you frame it that way, it makes my life seem a lot more glamorous than it actually is. But but thank you. Um, okay, so I think intrinsic in a lot of creatives is a is a strong fear of failure. Like, uh, and I remember um, I was a student. I was uh, really lucky to be a student of Milton Glaser, and you know he talked about that fear of failure as a as a driving force. And, you know, it's, it's where people, they, they don't want to go back to where they were. They want to get better. And I, that was something that was kind of always instilled in me is like, you know, I, I want to be better than where I was or who I was yesterday. And to be able to grow as an individual, you find strategies that help you achieve that. You know, you know if there's an individual who's really gifted at sports, you know, that's something becomes a driving force for them. And they pursue that as a way to get to the next level, whatever that is, or someone who's really good at, at writing. And they end up incorporating that into their day to day. It's discovering things about yourself um, and being self-aware and the things that make you happy and the things that can drive you as a human being. Is that, is that a fair answer? Does that make sense? Uh, that, that makes okay, sense. At a high level. At high level. Um, okay. But, as far so you mentioned you studied under Milton Glaser. So you, you were this high school kid. Did you go to um, where did you go to college? Sure. So so from high school, uh, I was really interested in like theater and art. Um, I, I I wasn't the great student as as I mentioned before, um, but art school was a viable option. So um, Rutgers University has an art program. And I, I got accepted there, which is really great. You know, portfolio and kind of do that. And it was really interesting is that at uh, at Rutgers, you know, um, like most art schools, like you have the work on the wall. Yeah. Oh. And the stuff that's there. And the marketing department for the university was on the first floor. And marketing department came up to me and said like, hey, would you be interested in doing theater posters for the theater department and the musical arts? And I was like, I was, sounds like an amazing opportunity. Uh, I'm like, I get paid for this? And they're like, yeah, you know, we have budget, we pay for this, it's fantastic. I was like, yes, absolutely. Like, sure, absolutely. And like, then I went back to my desk and I was like, oh, okay, now I have to figure out what a contract looks like and what things go on an invoice and you know just pro tip for any of the high school students there you know if an intro interesting opportunity comes up just say yes and figure it out later you know and um like like most things as well like good work begets good work you know so i think it was 18 in college i, I started my design agency for lack of a better term and continued to do really work and really good work and continued to do that after I graduated and it became a source of income and it became a, a really interesting way for me to continue to grow and you know from that you know I ran an agency for many years I'll give you the cliff notes version of my career between high school and GE uh, so running my agency you know I ended up doing really well I was, I was pretty good at my job and you know I drove a success for a wide variety of companies and products um, Good work, you get more good work, you get, you know, better clients and, you know, work with startups to Fortune 200 companies. Um, it was really amazing, like, you know, you could do some light Googling, CNBC did a show on me and profiled some of the brand work I did. It's cool, you actually see me with more hair, which is nice. Uh, but one of the cool things, too, is like Bloomberg was a client of mine. And, you know, working with Bloomberg, working for this amazing global organization, you know, I was able to use design to affect change on an unprecedented scale you know it's fantastic and like as i was doing that that work you know i realized something in me i was like you know, i want to do more stuff like this like i want to be able to like you know use my design skills for the forces of git and you know do some pretty amazing work 
And as that was going on, I was keep my eye out on, on brands or companies that are doing interesting things. And then the GE opportunity came up and um, I blindly applied on the website. I didn't have any connections, didn't know anybody there. Just, I applied on the website and, and I ended up working for a pretty amazing brand. Wow, that's uh, really impressive. Um, so I, I'm going to, after the, I do these interviews, I, I'll publish um, a piece, I'll send it out to you, but um, I'm, I'll, I'm gonna reference your websites and where people can view your work. So, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, so people can kind of see what, what it is you're describing and talking about. Um, I know you've spoken about behavioral psychology before, uh, behind doing what you enjoy and allowing that to drive you. I mean, you're kind of talking about that now. What, what is it you do outside of work that drives you? Okay, let me let me clarify how you frame that question. I'm, I don't think behavioral psychology is is a driver. It's definitely an accelerator. It, it okay. whatever it is you're doing, it'll just make it easier. Um, so, and that's been um, that's been a kind of a backbone of how I work as as a creative leader is like understanding. Um, the how and why of, of people doing things. And, you know, as a designer, as you're creating for audiences, it's important for you to know that anyway. Um, but definitely, it's definitely an accelerator and it's been something that's helped me out a lot. Uh, the thing that drives me is, you know, the, 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 the happiness that I get from, from creating things, whether it's, you know, a logo, an app or a website, you know, I just, I, I, I really enjoy the ability to create things. That's my non-negotiable like throughout life just to do that. And whether it's like cooking or furniture making or whatever, like it's just something that, you know, makes me happy and I enjoy it. Um, also, you know, it has the added bonus of being able to um, be a, a great way to make a living, you know, and just like um, Bob Baxley, who's this really uh, impressive uh, thought leader. And, you know, when he talks about a lot of like uh, design in relation to high school. And when you talk about the starting salaries of just entry level designers, like it's amazing, you know, just for, for people just starting on the careers of, you know, can have a very good quality of life. So it's just, it's good stuff. You know, now as, as, as I'm in the, the phase I am in life, one of the things I enjoy creating is just, you know, more leaders, um, not just, you just, you know, creative leaders, but like better creative leader, creative leaders, you know, even at the Fuse Conference, which I'll be at shortly, you know, I'm teaching a master class on creative leadership, just because I think it's, it's an important skill set that needs to get developed for our community. How did you, um, you're not the first person I've spoken to who um, at this level um, has a focus on leadership. And uh, Stephen Gates, this reminds me of Stephen Gates, he, yeah. he's talking about, you know, as a designer, you hit a certain level where you're excellent at what you do. You could do a layout, you could do a graphic, you could yeah. do, uh, you know, a prototype, whatever. Uh, you've done it for so long and this, you, you know, you can rock it. But when it comes to leading people or managing people, it's, it's an entirely different uh, skill set yep. that you have to learn. What, what do you think fundamentally uh, is the difference there? Making that jump from, you know, here I am good, at my craft, but now I want to manage people and then maybe perhaps lead people. Okay, um, well, uh, there, there has to be the want. Like there's a lot of people who get elevated who may not be good leaders and that's, I hear that all the time. Um, so there has to be the desire to do that. Um, and it's really good when people know that they don't want that. Some, some folks I think yeah. think they want it, but they really don't. Um, yeah, I think being self-aware of what you want and what you don't want and what you're capable and not capable. I mean, that's fine. I mean, there, I mean, even understanding where you are in your career trajectory, like um, when I was, um, when, when me and my wife were pregnant with, her, with our, our, our first kid, like one of the things was, you, you know, we had an opportunity to accelerate our, our, our career pathing, but it was like, all right, if we do that, then like the time we spend with our kids gets the minutes. Like, you, you make those calls and right. it's more time. And even, um, the book Radical Candor, Kim Scott talks about that too, is like the right time for when you want to take those, those leadership jumps. Um, like what, focus the question, how, how can I help you with that? So, um, all right, I mean, I can even make this personal because I've, at my position, I've become somewhat of a business leader, but you know, um, you know, it's at a certain level. I'm not at a C-suite point. Okay. I, I don't know if, uh, you know, it, it would be very unusual for a design professional to make it to the C-suite at my, at my company. So that's a good example. So if I was to say, it's not that I, I had my, my 
eyes set on a, a C-suite position. That's, that's not really what I'm about. But um, if somebody in my position were, say, were to say, okay, I'm a, I'm a design manager, but now I really want to kind of up my game and get a seat at the table, the leadership table, and, and help, say, a CEO make strategic decisions. Okay. Or, or I want to shape other people. And how do I do that? I can manage people. We can get things done. But how do I help to shape somebody's trajectory? Okay. Is that, is that too loaded? Well, there's, there's a lot to unpack, but that's okay. That's okay. We're good. We got time. Um, I, heard, I heard two specific questions. How can you, um, where you are in the org, talk to leadership about the value of what you're doing and how to climb up that ladder to a degree? And the second question I heard was, um, how do I start uh, molding and guiding and leading people? Is that correct? Yeah, I would, I would assume that it's kind of interconnected. Okay. Um, but maybe that's... I see them as different things, but, but okay, no, I'll, I'll roll with this. Um, okay, so if you're in a, a managerial position and you want to elevate, and it sounds like the roadblock is the executive level or convincing them of that, um, there's a couple things you can do. Um, it's, it's always helpful when you're in an organization that values design. You know, I, right. I was very lucky at GE, like the vice chair, Beth Comstock, who's like the second lieutenant of the whole company. Like she's a huge patron of design. Like, yeah. out through, like through that entire family tree, like everyone understands the value of design and how it could drive global businesses forward. If you're working at Apple or Nike of all those, like all those other brands that everybody loves, like that's understood. Yeah. But um, like I want to give talks to people who are like, you know, management really doesn't understand what I do and design is a, a stop in the pretty factory before it goes out the door. Um, like that's a challenge. So it's like understanding the dynamic of what you have to do. Um, I'll make the assumption that in your particular situation, they understand the value of it. I would say there's a, more recently, there's an effort to understand it than in the past for sure. Well, that's good. So um, there's okay. a kind of a, a start there. Yeah. Okay. So, so something you can try and do, this is super practical and tactical. Um, uh, and, and one of the things that, that I did a lot at GE whenever I was talking to an executive leader is like, this is where empathy and active listening come into play is like, you really need to understand the leadership that you're working with. Like what's important to them, who they are as people, like what are their goals? What are their business drivers? Like what are their, what are their personal uh, objectives I'm trying to do is like, you have to be really understanding of that much as the same way, like a designer would design for, um, yeah, like a product for an individual. Like you really need to understand the people and what their goals are. And this is where like the business understanding comes into play, where you need to, you need to really comprehend how design fits into their ecosystem. And then you, you how brand or strategy or design can help them achieve that. And like, you know, don't, don't BS, like it needs to be real. But, you know, if you can make that connection, if you can connect the dots for them about how this is a business, how design is a business driver, how design is an accelerator, how brand can strategically help them achieve whatever the hell they want to do, you know, it brings you closer to that, you know, proverbial seat of the two. Is that, is that helpful? It's like just a very simple strategy. No, that's great. Do you have, because I've, I've heard this kind of, um, this kind of idea before. I think uh, an example might really hit home. Is there any examples of that you can think of in your, in your experience where, okay, you had kind of a, a C-suite team or, or individual who wasn't really, wasn't really appreciative of the value of design and you had a strong design leader coming in, maybe it was you, a uh, strong design leader came in and kind of, converted that that leader or persuaded because it's like what I see is you have businesses that really value design and then other businesses that you know it's just not part of the culture oh okay all right I'll, I'll let Tim answer that question um, and it's this a, is an, this is an improv yeah, it's an improv yeah. question but first first at the gate um, like there's no there's no silver bullet there's no golden snitch there's no like one way that this makes everything happen um, if you're working with an individual who doesn't get the value or, or there are challenges with it too, um, something that has been helpful for me is understanding that every one of these individuals you're working with manages a P&L. Like they manage um, 
a ledger that, that has all the itemizes of the business making money. And if you can quantify the metrics of how design can influence those things and like really like specific, not like not vanity metrics, but real like concrete ways that it will affect change makes your job a whole lot easier. Yeah. Uh, I've done that myself. It's, and it's, I mean, frankly, it's, it's what separated me from all the other designers I've worked with at Good this organization. I'm, cool. I wouldn't say I'm brilliant at it, but it's like, you know, in the, in, what is it in the land of, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, I, I guess. Sure. You know? sure. I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, all right, and, cool. Sorry. sorry. Uh, you were, you were, the second question was, was about um, managing or, or helping grow leaders. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a real distinction there um, between being a manager and, say, being a leader. Because I, I think when you're being a manager, you're kind of focused on tactics or yeah. results. You're, being a leader, you're more focused on people. Maybe I've answered my own question there. But being a leader, you're more about developing the people you're talking with. Would you say that's... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's your answer. So, I mean, for you, I, th I think that'll, that'll work. And I, I think there's, there's a lot of goodness in that too. You know, like, you know, as you talk manager and managing people and, and leading, there's a certain aspect of inspiring. Um, there's a certain aspect of helping people along. And, you know, there's also an aspect of, uh, I think some of the best leaders kind of, they don't give you the direction. They help you get there on your own, which is what I think what just happened a minute ago. So, yeah. yeah. Good for you. Is it good for me or is it good for you? <laughs> I just, yeah, I just work here. I just picked up the WebEx. So I'm just, I'm just talking to y'all. But if you, if, if you glean some insight from talking to me, that's my job here is done. Thank you very much. No, it'd be great. If I could get a certificate after this uh, discussion, that'd be great. Yeah, no um, so uh, moving on to more okay. questions. Um, so the Fuse tagline this year is uh, design, brand, and the business, the new unity. And it was inspired by the old Bauhaus tag of art and technology, a new unity. So we're, we're bringing a correlation there to the, to the old Bauhaus since we're celebrating uh, the 100th anniversary. Uh, with regards to, uh, to this new tag, brand in the business, can you talk about um, how you've managed successful dialogue with, with executives? Um, because you've clearly had dialogue with uh, sure. business executives. And, and, you know, once you're having those relationships, what is that like, having to kind of maintain and, and manage? Well, uh, I think at that level, you're not, you're not managing the relationship. It's more of a, like a simpatico partnership. But uh, when, when you talk about the executives, just to reiterate a point I made earlier, you know, everything gets tied to the business. You know, it's like, how does this help the business on, on a more global level? You know, most of the executives you'll be working with, like, they're not, like they don't have, they're trying to solve honest to goodness business problems. Like they don't have time for the cosmetic ones. So it's just like, you know, whether it's like elevating stock price or there's a challenge in one of the business units or an entire unit's underperforming, like those are, those are big things that they got to deal with, you know, and how does design help them do that? So it's really, and I, I get this too, when you're at that level, you're, you're really bringing your A game and a, and an executive really want you to step in and, and be able to just jump in and, and be there and, and show up. Yeah. I mean, that's expected of you at yeah. that level, you know, even, even more so. Um, your, your job is to elevate the culture, you know, and if you're, right. if you're like a VP of brand or, you know, uh, a head of global design or something like that, you know, that whole function is, is representative of you. So, you know, that's kind of where you are at that level. Yeah. No, that's, that's really good to hear. Um, okay. So next, how do you see um, today's design challenges in comparison to the Bauhaus from 100 years ago? So, so we were talking about, you know, graphic design was arguably invented by, you know, in that era. Uh, it, it was like industrialized communication, you know, uh, machines doing type and uh, mass producing uh, stuff and this was kind of the mentality of the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus was, um, you know, in designing for dust in the industry. Uh, today, I would argue we're, we're kind of uh, inundated with all of that stuff, all these objects from the past hundred years. 
and what designers are facing different challenges and what would you agree and and if so what would you say those challenges are okay well i might respectfully push back about the origins of design but that's irrelevant to the question i think that the challenges that they would face are you know, similar to today i mean there was a lot going on culturally at the time and you know art has always been a representation of the culture and in that design is a service of function and i think today's designers um like back then um in the bauhaus you had a multi-discipline approach to design you know you weren't just a painter you did many things you know you did posters you did layout you did industrial design you did a lot of things and, and much like how how today's designers are expected to understand customer experience and ux and coding and you know as well as all of the other things go there and i think building on that too the challenges that the designers are going to face is now that you know design is getting that seat at the table and they're working more with business leaders and affecting change in probably one of the more complicated eras in the history of time, you know, they're expected to do more. And they're also expected to understand business. They're also expected to understand negotiation and influence. And a lot of these, uh, you know, these business school strategies in order to be more effective. And some of the designers who are doing really amazing work now, like they get that and they understand that. And they could also have the added bonus of being able to, galvanize teams and inspire cultures and do pretty great things. Do you think um, the designer of today is more of a, is designing enterprise more than in the past? I think enterprise has, is better positioned to affect change. You know, when you think about the enterprises that are, that are coming up, um, the new businesses, the ventures, and it's just yeah. and people are, you know, taking advantage of, of new opportunities and discovering new strategies for success. I think there's a lot going on. There's, there's a ton going on. That's, that's for sure. Um, well, that's pretty much um, all the questions I have for you, Andy. Do you have any, anything you'd like to kind of uh, say in summary for us? So I have like a thousand and two questions for you, man. Like what's going, like, I'm really excited for the Fuse conference this year. What are you looking forward to? What's the value that like, you know, you expect people to walk away with? I mean, it's going to be a great conference. You have kind of like some of the best of the best designers on the planet all under one roof. So I'm super excited. What's your perspective, man? Um, yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled. I mean, uh, this is my most, the most I've ever been involved with Fuse. Um, this podcast we're doing, um this is my second interview so um hopefully i'll get a little bit better and and thanks for your time oh, you're going out um but of course okay. all, all of these i mean just just for me what really excites me i, I really geek out on having these kinds of discussions with folks like yourselves mm -hmm. um so that's my my selfish um right. excitement about it but yeah i will be i'll be there in chicago i think uh working with julie she's been fantastic so yeah, she's awesome. She's really helping to re reshape Fuse this year. Uh, to your point, it's it's a completely different um, speaking faculty. I mean, we're kind of rebuilding it. We're we're definitely in a rebuilding year. Uh, there's a lot more focus on, um, you know, speaking at the enterprise level. Um, we're we're talking. You know, I, what I'm seeing is it's it's more about digital. We're we're you know the Facebooks and Googles and IBMs and less about uh, CPGs, because Fuse used to be about sure. package design. And so I'm, I'm seeing a transition there with this conference. So, um, and then again, me selfishly, um, I'm, I'm really trying to push with Julie that we you know, extend what Fuse is beyond the three-day event. So the, the event's gonna be fantastic. It's, it, we'll have a blast there. But I'm really trying to kind of um, push a, a content side to fuse that really hasn't been um present before that's what uh this is about so yeah well i, I think that's good and, and leaving having those content pieces like i think are really great and i think i, I being a total fanboy of, of conferences like i i appreciate those things so i think that's really good um 
Was from, from our chat today, was there anything that particularly stood out that you found value in? Um, well, I'm never, cease, it never ceases to amaze me how kind of down to earth uh, these business leaders I talk to are. So, you know, again, like if I try to think back when I was like a high school kid, uh, you know, because this is one of the themes we're, we're aiming at. Um, you know, I am, I am the rock star that I, I once was kind of intimidated to be. And even yeah. today, I, I have so much more to learn, so much more to achieve. But I think, you know, back then I was just thinking kind of clueless. I had no idea how, how this worked. Or, um, you know, you are talking a little bit about being that oddball in yeah. school. I mean, I, I totally uh, related to that. And I think um, really kind of sending that message to the next generation of you might be the weirdo in your class but guess what if you're finding that you're you know mind mapping or you're you're approaching problems differently than everybody else in the class mm -hmm. and you want to understand the meaning behind it or something because this was my thing mm -hmm. you know I, I felt school was kind of alienating I, I wanted to know why are we doing this and um, eventually that caught up with me I found a, a career being a creative. So um, I think that's really what resonates with me is uh, sometimes I get very grandiose and I think, oh, there's, there's all these folks out here and there's big names, Coca-Cola and Facebook and Target. Uh, but at the end of the day, these are all people uh, just like me, you know? So I think that's really what resonates with me. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy to, to add to that. Uh, was there anything that that I made more complicated? No, that's an, <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing jumps to mind. Did you make more complicated? I felt like some of my questions may have been a little complex, but uh, I tend to improv a bit too. I, I think that's important. And sometimes uh, I've been told I, I I can be a bit verbose, uh, but that's okay. You know. No, yeah, I thought I thought you were fine, and when when focused, I thought it was even better. So I good. think you're a, you're a pretty good interviewer, and I appreciate the time. And I thought the questions were really thoughtful, actually, and and it's gave me some stuff to think about. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andy.